Hi, welcome back to another episode of my Sankofa Pan-African series. Let's take off from the question that I raised in the last episode. Why the grand attempt to manipulate or distort history? Well, the answer to this question raised by people like John Henry Clark, who I mentioned in the last um, episode, is not far-fetched. It was done to justify slave trade and colonization. In order to justify these dastardly acts, Europe needed to fabricate a history which emphasized its presumed superiority and minimize the contributions of all other groups of people. The easiest way to justify slavery and colonization was through the fabrication of a history that glorified the role of the white race as the only race which had the ability to civilize the world. To do so, they had to deny the roles of all other people and in the process, they dehumanized them. Those of you like me out there who are naturally skeptical might then ask when and how did this falsehood gain ground? Thankfully, there are a few historians who have shed light on these questions. Alongside John Henry Clark and other scholars like Cheikh Anta Diop, Ali Mazrui, and several others who have tackled the questions. For instance, John Henry Clark and John G. Jackson, another great historian, identify the 15th and 16th centuries as the period when the distortion of history was instituted. So why the 15th and 16th centuries? Well, for the European continent, the 14th century was marked with calamity after calamity. First, they suffered a massive destruction of their livestock and then faced two periods of famine major food scarcity because crops failed. And the crops failed because they were over-exploiting their land. Next, the population of Europe was almost wiped out by the bubonic plague, or sometimes also called the Black Plague. Now, let's pause for a minute and think about how the coronavirus is ravaging many countries in the world presently. Then, imagine the devastation of a similar situation on the countries in Europe after the famines. Remember, Europe did not have the advantage of science, healthcare, and technology that we have today. Life for the people on that continent was further complicated by the Hundred Years' War between France and England. Even the weather started getting bad and a period called the Little Ice Age set in. This meant that the winters became colder and lasted longer. This, of course, also impacted food supply. The long and short of it is that countries on the European continent were poor and riddled with disease. They were afraid that they would be wiped out. In desperation, their kings and queens paid and equipped mercenaries who are now known in world history as explorers. They financed them to go to continents like Africa, the Americas, and Asia which were less populated, had and still have way more natural resources. They sent these mercenaries to go and pillage those places and bring back the bounties to Europe. I'm sure that you're familiar with some of these people, like um, Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, Niccolo de Ponti, Ponce de Leon, Ferdinand Magellan, Amerigo Vespucci, Richard Francis Burton, David Livingstone, Henry Stanley, Henrik Bath, 
Frederick Russell Bonham, Mongo Park, a whole bally lot of them were unleashed to go and pillage the rest of the world. It's important that we mark those names because we keep coming across them time and time again as people who discovered this land or, or, or that river or founded you know, this continent and so on. So I'll, I'll return to some of these so-called explorers at a later date. Now, these were the people who helped lay the foundation for Europe to colonize the world. One irony of this era in European history should strike us today because it is being played out before our very eyes. The same European countries that were so broke and were made prosperous mainly because of the proceeds got by colonizing and pillaging other parts of the world are so self-righteous now about keeping people from those same continents out of there, uh, um, out of Europe. Anyway, back to the 15th and um, 16th century. It was the same period when Europe needed to extend itself to Asia and Africa that the claim about racial supremacy became institutionalized. These views about the superiority of the white race were reinforced by people like um, George William Frederick Hegel, one of the most celebrated Eurocentric philosophers who described Africans as people who are underdeveloped and devoid of morality, religions, and political constitution. People like Hegel helped to justify Europe's enslavement and colonization of Africa because Europe's territorial ambition needed a deliberate policy to colonize minds by falsifying history. One of the ways that they did this was to put forward the lie that ancient Greece was the cradle of civilization. However, as Professor Ali Mazri points out, the civilization of ancient Greece would not have been possible without the Egyptian civilization. This is because the Egyptian civilization was earlier than the Greek civilization. Rather, Greece borrowed heavily from the Egyptian civilization. Even within current academic circles, when some Eurocentric scholars are forced to concede that the Greek and Roman civilization, which followed the Greek one, borrowed heavily from Egypt, they very quickly put forward another lie. They claim that ancient Egypt was completely isolated from the rest of the African continent, and so it should not be seen as an African civilization. Some even go so far as to try to claim that Egypt is an extension of the European continent. This is why historians like Robert R. Palmer and Joel Colton start their account of world history by first proving that it is wrong to even look at Greece or Rome as proof of European influence on civilization because the very idea of Europe as an entity is a very current one. The phenomenon that we know as Europe today did not even exist during the Greek and Roman civilizations. These historians also show that, on the other hand, it is more historically accurate to trace the contributions of black Africans to ancient Egypt than to link Europe's claim to the Greek or Roman civilizations. They challenge claims by Eurocentric historians who project the idea of Europe as the forerunner of world civilizations. Palmer and Colton prove that even the very word Europe did not exist during the Greek civilization and it was hardly used by the Romans.
As a matter of fact, the Romans considered all other Europeans as barbarians. Another interesting fact is that in spite of ancient Roman snobbery, and they were quite famous for looking down on other people, they did not discriminate on the basis of race. Rather, their system was based on Roman citizenship. It was based on the attainment of Roman citizenship. As such, many of the neighboring people in what is now known as Europe, whom the Romans conquered and subjugated alongside people of other races, were treated the same by the Roman Empire. People from present-day Britain, France, Spain, and so on, were subjugated by the Romans who saw themselves as, superior, as their superiors. I hope I have sufficiently answered the question about when history, as most of us know it, became twisted. Please send me your questions if um, you'd like me to throw more light on some of the issues that we've raised here. I cannot guarantee that I'll have all the answers, but I'll try. I'm also inviting those of you out there who have more information that might help all of us expand our knowledge as we go along. So please send your contributions. Now, in addition to twisting history, some Europeans over time have also continued to present their culture as if it is superior to other cultures. It is one of the methods used to dominate, colonize, and dehumanize people. If we look closely at history, there are many examples of how this works. Like I said earlier, the Romans conquered most of their neighbors and used a system of cultural negation to keep them down. The Roman Empire pushed forward the idea that they were superior to pretty much all the nations that we now recognize as part of Europe. It is therefore not surprising that when these other countries that emerged to now form the European continent and were then forced, you know, by the calamities that I mentioned earlier on, um, to find ways of um, surviving and enriching themselves because they lacked natural resources and, and all of that, they also used the system of cultural domination which the Roman Empire had used against them. The British, French, Dutch, Portuguese, Spaniards, all of them used variants of the same system of oppression and domination. It does not matter whether the colonial policy was through direct or indirect rule. The intention was always the same. The aim was to subjugate and dominate through the colonization of the mind. For instance, the French actively did this through a process of assimilation. The French had an underlying policy which allowed them to suffocate the cultures of the people under their rule. They implanted French political, economic, and cultural ideas. Through this process, the colonized people were taught to aspire to become like the French people in order to obtain full French citizenship and therefore full humanity. In other words, they equated French citizenship to humanity. Now, on the other hand, Although the British did not call their system assimilation, their approach was not really different from what the French did. 
I'll give you an example from Nigeria. In Nigeria, Lugard perfected a system which allowed external military and tax control to be operated by the British, while other aspects of rule were supposed to be left to local people and traditional um, rulers, who were then either coerced or forced into becoming puppets who served the interests of Britain. Another way through which the British colonized the minds of the countries that they ruled was through the imposition of the British educational system and the use of the English language. The British deliberately created a class system which was based on people's ability to ape, to imitate them. In other words, how well a person was able to speak the king or queen's English determined how civilized the person was. Imagine how much time our forefathers spent learning to act and sound British just so that they could be considered enlightened people. Meanwhile, this was done at the expense of their own oral and other cultural forms of education. This system of cultural negation and domination was not only done in Africa. In India, for instance, the system was built into the education system by a man named Thomas Babington Macaulay. Please, don't confuse him with the Sierra Leonean returning to Nigeria. Thomas Babington Macaulay, uh, uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay who was the son-in-law of uh, Bishop Ajayi Crowder. The Thomas Babington Macaulay that I'm referring to here was a member of the British Supreme Council for India. He was the one who designed the British colonial education system that was used in India. He also developed the, the, the language, he also determined the language through which students in, in the colony were to be taught. He did not mince words about his vision of what education in the colony, colony should be. He specified that the British had to form a class to serve as their interpreters to millions of the people that they colonized. In India, he wanted this class of people to be Indian only in blood and color, but to be English in tastes, opinion, morals, and intellect. He is on record laying out his goal in the minutes of a meeting held in the parliament, in the British parliament in 1835. It is a system which the British then replicated in other colonies. I hope this proves that as Africans and people of African descent, we owe it to ourselves to actively engaging in challenging biased histories about Africa. We must continue to conduct our own research and share them widely in the most accessible formats. So if Africa is to make any significant stride towards any major form of development, our history cannot remain exclusively within academic circles. Our children must be taught, you know, people who do not have access um, to academic publications must know their history. And this is because, as Cheikh Antadiop points out, even a superficial examination of the cultural situation of Africa challenges us to question the predominant history being pushed forward by the Western world. Because if we're to believe their account, their history, 
then we have to first believe that Africans have never been responsible for any contribution to the world. Not even the civilizations of empires like Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Ife, Nok, Zimbabwe, the Congo, to mention just a few. If we continue to allow ourselves the falsehood that Africans had no part in civilizing the world, it means we will then continue to depend on the so-called developed world for the solutions to all our problems. Now, this has become increasingly important when we look at the ascendance of blatantly racist regimes like the Trump presidency in the U.S., Putin's apparent neocolonial aspirations, and the daily increase in the popularity of ultra-right politics in most parts of Europe. Again, we need to find ways to challenge China's aggressive economic colonization of Africa. If we do not know our own history, how do we equip ourselves and future generations if all we know about our past is a history which focuses only on internecine wars, transatlantic slavery, and colonization? As the Igbo proverb made popular by Chinua Achebe puts it, a man who does not know where the rain began to beat him cannot say where he dried his body. I'd like to expand this proverb by saying men and women who do not know when and how rain, the rain began to beat them cannot know how to dry themselves. Please, don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you have not already done so. Also, like and share our videos. Thank you once again for joining me on this journey. See you next time.